Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode Hi. of Suki TV. <laughs> uh, my name is Clara, and today I have a very distinguished guest who looks way younger than me today because of his avocado shirt. Yay. So, <laughs> <laughs> but without further ado, let me just introduce who he is, okay? So he's Mr. Patrick Tay, uh, the Member of Parliament for Pioneer SMC. So please introduce yourself briefly. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone uh, who's tuning in and uh, who's, you know, watching this live. Um, a very good evening to everyone. My name is Patrick Tay. Uh, as uh, Clara mentioned, I'm uh, the Member of Parliament for Pioneers SMC. Uh, but in my full-time job in the daytime, I'm actually Assistant Secretary General with the National Trades Union Congress, NTUC for short. And um, you know, I spend most of my time uh, um, looking after the interests and welfare of workers. And well, if you, if you do see me in action, whether inside Parliament or outside of Parliament, or, uh, always on manpower and labor issues. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. He's a big advocate, lah. But actually, today I'm very excited for this episode. Not only because he's here, but for the first time ever, right? We actually have food in front of us wow. for Sydney TV. So, yeah. uh, but today's today's topic is not only about food, okay? But I'll just ask uh, Mr. Patrick Day later, Mr. Day, yeah. or your friend Patrick, or Patrick, Mr. Avocado. Call, call me Patrick. Can I call you Mr. Avocado for today? Oh. <laughs> okay, no, 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 Patrick. Okay, Patrick. It no is. pun intended. It's Sydney TV, so the seat, single seat. That's the first thing that he said when he came in. Like, I wore this shirt because his seat. <laughs> I feel so overdressed today just because of his shirt. No, don't forgive her because she has uh, she's corporate colors to, I need to and branding to uh, observe. Yeah. But yeah, okay. So uh, this is not a mukbang. Uh, so we're not going to be eating and like talking, but yeah. uh, it just be like a, a fun thing that we will do along the way as we talk about more serious stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But you know, throughout the show, if you have any questions that you'd like me to ask, uh, Patrick, or you'd like to ask him personally uh, via YouTube live chat, just let me know. So you just need to comment on the YouTube live chat. And what will happen is I'll look at your questions there and then I'll just like ask him along the way, okay? So now or like during the show, anytime from now onwards, you can just ask your questions there. So just type that away and then we'll look at that later during the Q&A segment uh, in between the show. All right? Okay, so now speaking of topics, right? I know you yeah, She's an arsenal of questions. Uh, I, I prepared uh, today. Uh, he, uh, my, uh, I stand by water for him also because I'm ready to milk this opportunity that I have. Okay, okay you have only 55 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but speaking of topics today, what we'll discuss is uh, mainly financial literacy and about, you know, uh, the future of work and like, you know, employment yeah. and careers, especially in what we call now the new normal in Singapore. Right. Okay, so... Uh, how would you say, guys? Let, let's just start with uh, financial literacy, okay? Mm. So back in our parents' generation, um, I think financial literacy is not talked about as much, mm. you know. And I feel very blessed to be able to be doing, uh, be, be 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 able to be in this era, right, where financial literacy is almost like a norm, mm. right? You know, there's a lot of education about it, and there's a lot of resources that I can tap on to actually be financially literate, mm. right? But back then, it was not something, and it was not the case for our parents' generation. So my question now is, how would you like how would you describe how financial literacy has changed over the years and like maybe over the two decades? Yeah, I think um, many, many years ago, I mean, mm. when I was much younger, maybe 30, 40 years I'm ago. I'm very young. Uh, thank you, thank you. It's the shirt, yes, anything yes, goes. Yes, yes, uh, You know, your, your financial literacy is very simple. It's simply, you know, how you count your coins, make sure you have a POSB account and then uh, save and even put stamps, you know, on, mm. on that squirrel savers card thing. So, so financial literacy then many years ago was very, very in a very simplistic manner. You know, you save more than you spend, and uh, you always save for rainy day and, uh, and and things like that. But I think I think it's evolved through the years. Yep. You know, I have three kids, uh, two boys and a girl. Wow. Girls the younger, so uh, I have the benefit of seeing the entire education system. My my youngest one, uh, my daughter, she's uh, in primary five. Oh, okay. And then my my second son is in sec two. Oh. And my eldest in JC1. So oh, wow. I, I actually have a good bird's eye view of them. <laughs> Primary, well. secondary, and, and JC only for this year, lah, because they, you know. Just happened yeah, to be This in... year and next year, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, Primary, secondary, and JC. So actually, I, I, I see, you know, in our education system and some of the syllabus, uh, yes, well, we wouldn't say financial literate in that sense of, mm. uh, you know, competency in doing analysis or your ratios and what have you in the, in the real financial literacy sense. But I think they, they, are, they are being taught simple things like, you know, how to manage, how to count, mm. you know. Uh, so some of the, the simple math questions, for example, in primary school or even in secondary school, actually, uh, they, they kind of infuse kind of like practical examples or, yeah. and then uh, ask you questions or problem sums based right. on those. So I think in, in that sense, you are not directly learning like money 101 or financial literacy 101, but 
in, in a very subtle way, uh, you're picking up some of the skills in math and calculations. And, and of course, if you go up upper secondary, I mean, if you do like accounts, yeah. if you do uh, math in, in stats, probability stats, yeah. uh, uh, and, and, and in the JC, they have econs, like my eldest one is doing econs. So, so you, you actually will start knowing all these principles. Actually, right. I, I'm surprised, you know. Why? In fact, last year, I was just chatting with my, my elders. I mean, he was set four last year. Mm. So we were thinking now, I was telling him, no, uh, you know, I, I was deciding, should I spend this money on buying this thing, you know? Mm. Oh, uh, you asked him? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, should we buy a new soundbar, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I never have a soundbar at home. Yeah. So we were thinking, hey, shall we buy a soundbar? Then, then he straight away said, you know, uh, I think, uh, the capital depreciation is quite high, you know. Wow. So, you no, know, the things that come in and out, uh, out of fashion very quickly, and yeah. doesn't work anymore, and and uh, you depreciate so fast, you know that 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 few hundred dollars or thousand dollars you can do mm. and save it, and then you can grow and have a. Uh, I was quite shocked wow. when he said, uh, you know, uh, well, things like this, you know. So right. you were kind of like, wow. It's not bad, huh? I think the school may be teaching them something right. Huh? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. I think you, you learn about that in school, right? But for him to really use that term yeah, as yeah, well yeah, as a yeah. conversation that he has in life, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's right. very shocking, eh? Yeah, interesting. Wow, the school taught him well. <laughs> so I, 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 I kind of like, through that, through my conversations with my three kids, I kind of like think, well, in a way, uh, financial literacy is kind of being taught in many ways in the schools as well. Yeah. And I know uh, MAS uh, yeah. started the Money Sense and yeah. in partnership with some of the uh, police and going out to the community and I've partnered uh, mm. a few of these uh, yeah. groups uh, to really give financial literacy 101 particularly in this day and age where there are very, very various kinds of instruments you know? yeah. uh, investment instruments because when you talk about financial literacy last time it was just uh, don't buy so much, don't borrow so much save more mm. uh, but today it's quite different uh, you want to not just make sure you protect your capital you want to Look after your health, you're going to look after retirement, you look after accidents. And so it's a whole spectrum of, uh, of things that you need to look out for mm. than the traditional way of, uh, right. of, of looking at things. Wow. Because yeah. actually my next question was going to be asking you, right, since financial literacy is so important, why is it not being taught as like a subject in school or at least like a course in school? But uh, from what you're saying, right, actually, even though it's not like a very in-your-face course that we mm. have to take, right? But it's being incorporated into our education yeah. system like a little bit, a little bit, like yeah. at different stages of that's us right, that's progressing. Right. And, and, and I, know, I know, I remember, I mean, it was quite a fleeting glance. Yep. I think they also gave me five some of these uh, interesting stuff. But they know uh, lots of uh, students and youths actually uh, go on social media and go on various platforms. So I think they use interesting stuff to, to send some of these messages. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I think I think when they are young, they will tell them, you know, the the importance of being thrifty and you know, saving for for rainy day. I think those concepts still hold. Mm. Um, but I, but I think uh, well now in the, in more interesting formats. Yeah, because I feel like um the, like even though it's being incorporated in education, right? Um, there's there isn't really like a very in your face case. The school is now teaching you about being financially literate. Do you think this is something that we can see in the near future? Like, cause I'm sure. I, I, I think so. Really, uh... I think so. I'm quite confident that uh, <laughs> this may well be an important topic mm. because, uh, well, I partly fueled by the fact that uh, we are in a very digitalized environment, right? And also, uh, everything is digital now. Payments are digital. Yeah. So through through use of these various devices and the fact that. Uh, uh, you know, all this information is so readily available. Yeah. I mean, you just Google Financial Literacy 101 yeah. and uh, they'll a either bring you to CD right. as well. <laughs> 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 and then, uh, well, I sometimes refer because you all have nice charts on your blogs and, right. and uh, a very quick reference guide, especially if sometimes you forget certain figures, certain percentages, certain numbers. It's a quick reference guide. So I think, I think there's a lot of bite-sized information, a lot of infographics are available yes. where, you know, young people, of all, uh, people of all ages actually, mm -hmm can uh, readily access them and, and they are in multiple languages as well. Mm, yeah. Right. So there's a plethora of resources. It's yeah. just, you know, nowadays you just do Google search and then that's it. Everything just yeah. boom. It's all so now there. the challenge is, uh, yeah, the, 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 you get inundated by so much information, how to, you know, dissect and make sure you get the right information uh, right. across. Yeah. yeah. And also because sometimes one, in, like, just one topic or one subject can have so many versions. That's right. So like you really need to find out which is the one that is the most accurate or the one that really uh, relates the most to you. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's move on still on being financially literate. But what do you think while we have gone through, like we've improved along the years, you know, we've gone through great strides and getting more financially literate as mm. a community 
um, and as like a society in general. Uh, what do you think are still the greatest challenges, issues, and concerns that people have with, with regards to financial literacy? I think uh, I don't know, probably our mental models. Uh, I mean, mm. I, I think uh, we, 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 we tend to like, I think the importance of delayed gratification is very important. I yeah. think uh, uh, we all know that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, sometimes you spend more than you earn. Sometimes you, 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 well, it's, it's okay to reward yourself once in a while, but yeah. sometimes you must know your means and, you know, yeah. and, and the fact that, that there are a lot of variables around. You no, know, like what's happened in COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, no, it's really took everyone uh, and, and every country and every sector by storm. Um, uh, here you are, uh, you know, suddenly people who are very highly skilled in growth sectors suddenly become, that's like air travel. Yeah. I mean, who would imagine air travel is like put to a halt yeah. within a short period of time. So, so, it, so, so it's all these contingencies that it's a stark reminder to us that uh, um, even as we go about uh, looking at uh, financial literacy and preparedness, uh, mm. it's important to prepare for contingencies uh, yeah. and for the future. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, that, so that's important. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in the meantime, right, for those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, remember to get them through. Uh, just post them on our YouTube live chat and then we will show them on, uh, we will actually discuss this during the live show. So actually, I see one question that came through. Uh, this whole uh, concept of financial literacy and preparedness. Right. So I think uh, you know, it, it's the information is there. Uh, it's just for you to, you know, flip those pages and get them in bite-sized way. All right. So like for example, we've mentioned like how they can get these resources so easily, right? But there is still a gap between those who are getting educated and those who are not. Mm. How can we bridge this gap? I I think I I think it, it requires a whole community to do it. Mm. For example. Like in my pioneer community, yeah. um, we have we have a lot of many elderly, yeah. elderly folks. They may not be uh, so digitally savvy, uh, so well connected on on the virtual space, and know where to get all these resources. Yeah. So what 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 we do is uh, we we conduct some of these. Uh, now we can't do it face to face. I mean, yeah. we used to do it like a face to face kind of engagement and sharing. Uh, we get you know different partners, stakeholders <laughs> to come and share, uh, just like we did one recently uh, in Pioneer. And, and uh, that's one way. And of course, we have uh, now in, in the heartlands and in the community, yeah, you have uh, so-called uh, IT ambassadors as well as, <clears throat> we call it SG Digital Ambassadors, mm. to get them know, to know, you know, this is what you can do with your smart devices. And you can find out new information. You can get an update. You can do even a financial analysis of yourself. And, mm. and, and now I, I see that most of us are on uh, digital banking apps, um, Many of the digital banking apps have also a lot of financial 101 stuff mm. built into those apps. So I think uh, it's it's now helping to bridge the divide uh, um, for those who, who are not so savvy mm. uh, to get this kind of uh, information in the simple layman format. I think that's the challenge. Uh, so it's, it's going to be an ongoing treadmill journey. So like this one that you were saying that you organize this kind of courses for them, right? Yeah. What are... What, um, what demographics is it usually being made up of? I, I usually, usually, yeah, uh, the more mature uh, oh. residents are more mature residents. Hey, but yeah. that is exactly what they need, right? Because yeah. they don't know what is available. They need correct, people correct, like correct. This, uh, people like you who actually or yeah. your SNC who actually organize such stuff, so that's they know right, like, how they can easily right. assess these resources. And, and, and you'd be surprised, although it's uh, the mature ones want to know at least you know how to prepare because they are, they are nearing retirement. So they need to get some useful information to yeah. what to do next. No, yeah, now yeah. that I'm already fit, now that <laughs> yeah, they can't I'm, I'm actually I'm speaking about myself. Uh, now that I'm already fifty, I better prepare for retirement. <laughs> so you better know what to do. At least preserve your capital. Make sure your CPF. Uh, you know. That's why uh, you're talking yeah, more about financial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you'd be surprised. Uh, we did some of these uh, uh, sharing sessions. Actually, the younger ones are uh, you know fresh out of school or in starting their first job or starting a family, for example, mm. they're also uh, wanting to get more information to prepare. Mm, yes. uh, because, uh, you know, things are not getting cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, if you have kids, you have education costs. And uh, so so now financial literacy is beyond just talking about investments, investments, mm. making money. You know, it's, 
It's about in having insurance uh, and also helping to to uh, look after your own health and and, yeah. and, and wellness as well as uh, in event of any eventualities or contingencies. Yeah, I think, I think you pointed out that uh, uh, very accurately because I think in the past when people talk about oh being financially literate, I think they think of oh investments. Yeah. I think it was a very clear link. But actually today, yeah. uh, being financially literate is more than just investing. It's yeah. just like oh, uh, how do you prepare yourself if you, if you want to buy an HDB? Yes, or like what's right. the first like, if you just started working and you don't have a lot of money then like what insurance should you get first like it's kind of mm. basic ways of managing your money it's um mm. is what financial literacy is like more than just uh, investing even though we talk a lot about investing on cd yeah. but uh yeah don't 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 equate personal finance equals investing because it really isn't yeah. yeah okay so uh no, you've been a strong advocate for financial literacy mm. so talk to me about the initiatives or like um the the efforts that you've You've, you've spearheaded to push for this. Yeah, I like I said, uh, besides the webinars yeah. and the live webinars. Yeah, he, he, and he, he, he do a lot of talks these days, you know. He does a lot of talks these days. Very <laughs> hardworking, you know, but also because COVID-19, yeah, that's right? right. So we can't do a lot of the, the usual mass events. Yeah. So we try to, to, to do it uh, on the digital platforms, just like this, mm. and uh, to share useful information and tips. So we get nice uh, partners and experts in this, in various areas, to share uh, and give some practical handles and tips. Mm. For, for everyone to benefit from. So, so very, very important. Uh, I think uh, today, uh, our workforce profile is also changing quite a bit. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, now that we kind of like segue into the workforce profile, yeah, right? Soon. So now increasingly, there are more freelancers. Mm. Um, you know, as we are talking, there are about 200,000 uh, in Singapore yeah. who are in a freelance self-employed situation. Right. So as you know, freelancers, you don't have your compulsory savings See. from CPF. Well, if you earn a certain amount a year, you need to contribute to Medisafe, uh, mandatory, but uh, you don't have your employer CPF, like a normal employee or a person in employment relationship will be in, yeah. will have. Correct. So so therein lies the importance, uh, uh, it, it, the increasing importance of looking after uh, your finances mm -hmm. and financial literacy, because uh, here you have uh, no uh, financial contribution or should I say CPF savings yeah. from employers as well as yourself. Mm. So the discipline to wanting to do that and at the same time also, um, you know, preparing because um, most of us, uh, you know, who, who own HDB flats or plan to buy one will, will rely quite a bit of their CPF savings to make the first purchase yeah. or subsequent purchases. Yeah. So that's important. Mm. At the same time also, you need to do your own, you know, financial calculations like, because uh, uh, that's why uh, a bit taboo, but sometimes it's good to 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 declare your taxes because uh, if you need to borrow from a the bank, they want oh. to know how much you, you income you make, right? So if you don't declare how much income you make, okay. they won't be giving you a, a nice loan to to mm. finance for your house or whatever mm. that you want to buy. So so it's a it's a chicken egg thing. So so very important to look after some of these areas. So in our demographic workforce profile change has also resulted in us requiring to know some of these uh, you know financial right. literacy one hundred one mm. beyond your uh, your your traditional investments and stuff like that, and mind you, freelancers. I mean, they don't have uh, um, uh, workman compensation, uh, mm. work injury compensation coverage, so they need to buy their own personal accident policies and yeah. stuff like that. So, so these are some of the things that uh, we need to work, uh, watch out for. Right. Because I met quite a number of these freelancers who are my residents. They come to yes. me and then, oh, uh, you know, I I, I was uh, delivering grab food or, or you know doing delivery and then. Accidentally, I hit some uh, a car and the car scratched. Mm. So, so who's gonna pay for it? You know? if you don't have insurance, then what next? Right. So all these things are you. You wouldn't think of it when you were you're getting to that trade, right. but uh, it's things that you need to prepare for. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I I have questions later regarding career, but since we're already talking about this, right? I'll mm. just uh I want to jump on to talk about this freelancers topic as well. So I think for freelancers, right? Um, sometimes it seems a bit hard for them to quantify or qualify their work so like mm. especially because i have i have a freelancer uh friend uh which she struggles to sometimes justify why is it a certain rate that she's actually uh asking for yeah and i think it's a bit iffy because uh just because they are freelancers so for some reason it feels like uh their their, their work that is being the work that is being contributed by them is uh it doesn't it doesn't quantify the same amount mm. when it actually should be mm. yeah so uh, I'm sure there are some of these kind of stories that you actually hear yes. people come to you, yes. right? Then how, how do you go about advising these uh, people? So so what, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a few legal primers. We've got some freelance, uh, professional freelancers who, oh, who nice. are on, on panel uh, with me too. And they did 
quite a number of freelancers ask this question, but we always tell them you need to pluck the moral courage to, to give yourself a value. Yeah. Uh, a not, hard, not, like, not not easy, yeah. especially when you're just starting out yeah. uh, or you are you are in the weaker end of the bargaining yeah. uh, chip. So so I think uh, very, very important to, to see where you, you need you, yourself. Uh, it's a personal resolution. Uh, I mean, like, you know, how much you value your creative work, yeah. um, your services, as well as uh, whatever you're producing. Yeah. Uh, you need to put a value to it. I mean, you can do an industry comparison and put a value to it and then uh, stay, to the, stay to the cost and stay true to the cost. I mean, in that sense, not easy. Easier yeah. said than done. Uh, but, but I think sometimes buyers of, of, of creative works and services from freelancers right. also want to see you hold your ground, uh, particularly when you value it. I mean, you don't, price it too exorbitantly when you're fresh uh, doing it right. uh, but also you don't make you don't cheapen it as well uh. yeah otherwise people will know that you're you're just trying to like beat the, the person next to you, you know just okay. to get the deal yeah so i think you value it people people recognize that i think yeah. and and of course uh, this year uh, there'll be some changes to the copyright act mm. coming up yeah wow. so it's been introduced in parliament just not too long ago <laughs> so we're we're going to talk a bit about it and how to better protect uh, creators of all this uh, you know uh, copyright mm. uh, and also be recognizing their contributions and you know recognizing their, their creative work right actually mm. i think what you just shared right doesn't only apply to freelancers i think it also applies to people like me uh. so next time if i know i want to <clears throat> get a raise right <laughs> i need to <laughs> remember what you just said too late like you come now my 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 uh, um, appraisal period just ended oh, okay, i cannot okay. use okay. anymore no but next time okay next time yeah, but yeah. anyway it's really to um I think hold your ground to some extent, yes, especially yes. for freelancers. You have to be, I think, to some extent, a bit more thick skin yeah. and fight for what you want. Because to be honest, like it's it's only you that you're fighting for yourself. Yes. Yeah. And if you know that you are at like a sadly, sometimes uh lack like of a better word, the lower part of the food chain, then you gotta fight mm. for yourself. Yeah. Okay. So um hopefully that helps for those who are you know seeking career advice or are struggling, or it's a freelancer mm. who you know is struggling to get your gigs, you know. Maybe this is just like two cents from Mr. Patrick Tay yeah. who can help you. Okay, so um, you know, back onto financial literacy, right? COVID nineteen. Do you think he said so? For example, you went on uh to do a lot more talks because everyone's at home, yes, and then you right. delivered more of this like online digital content. So, do you think there's a uh, increase in interest in financial literacy amongst Singaporeans during COVID nineteen? I I think there is. Really? You know why? Because they, they, they just announced right. And the government just announced uh, last year everyone topped up their CPF. Right. There was a record amount of uh, people <laughs> topping up their CPF, yeah. uh, repaying back their their mortgage loans, uh, you know, in back into their CPF, and and uh, people proactively uh, topping up their special accounts and stuff yeah. like that. So that's actually a good indication that right. people know that it's a difficult time. There's a lot of uncertainties. Even the 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 bouncing back is quite uneven, mm. and uh, people find ways to you know. Protect well, we talk about capital protection, uh, protect yeah. their wealth. And, you know, CPF is, uh, as you know, is, is backed by the government in that sense. And uh, it gives you a nice interest rate. Um, why not, you know? So rather than you, you try to like test into other investments and instruments, uh, yeah. this will be a, a fail-proof method of saving and yet seeing a, uh, you know, capital preser preservation as well as a bit of growth as well. Mm. Yeah, I test you. Have you heard of the one and six five movement? Uh, sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, that tree, is it? <laughs> no, About... so basically, uh, there's this uh, financial guru in this space where actually oh, okay. became like a million and just through CPF, like invest, uh, saving in the right way for okay, CPF. Okay, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, no, I, I read, uh, you know, uh, a few of them wrote articles on, on oh, yeah. Sunday. Oh, Sunday. And talk about, um, you know, finance and invest. The, yeah. invest I mean, I read them. Quite, quite good. Correct, correct. And, and most of the time I read, I notice... Everyone says saves your in your CPF and special account. Yeah, because you know investing is not for everyone, yes, right? Some right. some can't take that kind of uh, risk. Yeah. So actually, but there's still a way that you can save smartly through CPF. Yeah. Right. That's right. That's right. I mm. mean, it's it's almost like capital protected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, no nowhere Guaranteed else. Guaranteed. Yeah. Insurance. I mean, I mean, some people say you know why not I I have some property and then uh, lease it out. And you never know, no. I mean, with this kind of climate, you know, yeah. you, you may not have the lease. Mm. And even if at least you you are a landlord, you have a lot of obligations. Uh, yeah. Under landlord and tenant law, you have lots of obligations. And when things go awry or bad, then uh, you have a lot of other costs which right. uh, you don't really see up front. So okay. so actually, if you want a, like a uh, a very fail proof way, uh, uh, of course, a CPF is a good start starting yeah. point. Uh. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So really figure out. There's always something for someone, but you're just gonna figure out what works for you, yeah. right? Okay. So since we're talking a little bit about uh investing, mm. Shavin Sikera actually mm. asks, "What's Mister Tay's own investment portfolio like? Actually, do you invest?" I I actually I wished I had, uh, you know, if if I had the benefit of hindsight and you know, really go back in time, uh, uh. I would have started much earlier. But right. I, like I said, uh. Uh, what I have now is I, I don't have multiple, but I only got one my, my own uh, home that I live in. I mean that's that's basically it. Right. Uh, and and because of the time that I have, I don't really have time like some people. You know, they monitor the stock market, they oh. monitor what's happening in Nasdaq and all this. So uh, yes, I I have some blue chip. I buy some blue chip shares, ETFs. Right. I mean the 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 one oh ones Yeah. Yeah. So I I don't go into anything more risky beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so his is more like the lower conservative, la, I would say conservative, <laughs> la. and of course, uh, CPF, la, special right. account. Uh, yeah. yeah, unlike his avocado shirt, he, for his investments, he's quite conservative. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so in the meantime, uh, I, I wanted actually, my, my, my son Eddie was telling me, hey, that you should go into Bitcoin, you know, because, wow. I, because I was in, well, I was sharing, I, was, I went to, <clears throat> because I look after the financial sector, you know, the trade unions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, in the last couple of years, I was very involved in the financial sector, and then. I went. I wanted to get a better idea of it, so I went for this fintech program together with the Singapore Fintech Association. Yeah. I went for like a two, three day program, so to better a skills future program. Right. Uh, to make use of my skills future <laughs> credit, at the same time learn something, uh, and and pick up something that so that I, when I, uh, work with the industry, I know what's happening in the yeah. fintech sector. So that's where I started Ethereum and then set up a simple account, and that's for fun, uh. <laughs> I I and that was two years ago, and I wish I had taken it in the bold step. La. So my, my son was telling me, you know, two years ago, you learned about Ethereum or this. Why didn't you just at least buy oh. $100? You know, the $100 would have been like, you know, <laughs> 10 <laughs> times or 20 times more. So so there, there you are. But again, uh, uh, again, this is not a financial advisory yeah. uh, webinar. Um, right. You know, different people have different appetites and your your threshold for, for risk and stuff like that. So right. uh, it's, it's all up to you. And uh, I, I just happened to talk about it because... Uh, it was, a, it, was, it was a table conversation with my son. It was so cute. Yeah. You have a lot of random, actually you have a lot of interesting conversations with your children, right? They're actually yeah. still younger also, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they teach me how to connect with the younger ones. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, you yeah. wouldn't have like... No, no, thought. except recently when I told him, you know, uh, shall, 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 shall dad go into TikTok? And she gave me that flabbergasted look. I said, please don't. <laughs> Really? You thought about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's it, seems like, it seems like it seems like everybody's doing it. I mean, I'm Insta. You know, now, yeah. now I'm doing Insta Live and um, and Facebook. And I mean, I'm more active in LinkedIn because yeah. I mean, the topics I, I talk about, the things I, that interest me and, and uh, the areas I, I kind of like very passionate about are more like the professionals, managers, executives, labor, right. employment. Right. And therefore, I spend more and more time on LinkedIn. But I thought like, you know, I see everyone's on TikTok. So I, I try to like delve in it and try don't try <laughs> yeah my his warning uh both my son's warning to me oh my gosh yeah. hey but tiktok is a different ball game man eh? is it i i, I said i haven't tried it okay. i i, I have not, haven't taught my courage when, to try when it. you try wait, when you when you finally try let me know i support you i watch your videos okay <laughs> <laughs> i give you likes and i yeah, share yeah, it yeah yeah okay. i hear over the radio like you know over a tiktok somebody can get like sixty thousand yeah. views to, within crazy. 24 hours it is crazy so it's uh it's uh yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, maybe it could be you, you know? You yeah, never know. No, no. <laughs> the man with the avocado shirt. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so before we move on to, let's say, uh, to, to, to talk about career and employment, right? Okay, wait, let me look at some of the... Oh, yeah, the main topic okay, of yeah. your, your ad to get to people to watch him, this. You know? yeah. Because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Singaporeans always say, like, yeah, these kind of politicians, uh, they're too rich to eat hawker food. Uh, so oh, I'm, dear. I, that's my staple. Okay? Really? Uh, I mean, so, besides my wife's cooking. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, must, must say that. Like, I go home, <laughs> I kind of like... No, but anyway, like that's the whole reason why I decided to bring hawker food. So I'm really to test whether he knows. Because I know a lot of us always think, like, uh, you know, they, 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 they don't eat this kind of food. Like, Who too? say so? Oh, uh, no. Uh. Okay, yeah, okay. So that's he's... why I've been putting on weight this uh, circuit breaker and doing this work from home. Time. Oh, okay. Too much hawker food. So right in front of me right now, right, I actually have a uh, carrot cake. So carrot cake, black color, okay? Ding, ding, ding. Okay, so oh, yeah, yeah. I want you to guess how much we actually got this carrot cake for. Yeah. Uh, we got it from Chinatown Complex, by the way, because yeah. it's in our office. I, see, she, an she answered my question before I asked her. <laughs> Under ask, because I know different hawker centre, different coffee what, shops what, sells what? the same thing at different prices. Oh, wow, you know your stuff. Eh? Yeah, that's why. Oh. That's why because I, I mean, I've been living in Budok South. Some of you know me. I mean, uh, or, or people who see me around. I live in Budok for like, 
last 45 years. Wow. So, so, wow. And, I, and then I subsequently served in Yishun. <laughs> and then now in Pioneer and previously Boon Lay. So I have the east, the west, the north. So I had a chance to like, taste a lot of food from uh, different parts of Singapore. Wow. Uh, I, I, as an Eastie, I mean, East generally has more Hey, hey food. I'm a Westie. Wow, yeah. wow, what is this? <laughs> He's trying to say that Eastie is the best. More, 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 more food, uh, more food options. Uh. Yeah, yeah. More food options. Uh, doesn't mean the best food are there, but more food options. But okay, back to your Chai Lao Kui. You asked me just now, oh, Chinatown complex. So why, what about Chinatown complex? Okay, I, I like Chai Lao Kui, right? Uh. Mm. Okay, three fifty. No, damn. <laughs> Actually, this one right, we got it at three dollars. Wow. <laughs> Not bad. Right? Not bad. Close lah. <laughs> Give me close a margin of error la. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> even though it was like uh, you can choose between three dollars, four dollars, or five dollars, but we chose three dollars lah because only oh, two okay, of us okay. left. So we. I see. I see. We don't want to over order, but one. Not bad. Not so bad la. Eat close lah. Do you eat black or white? I eat both. Oh really? Now they got yin yang, you know. So you can but have half white. Yeah, yeah. Also. No, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. But okay. I, I, I prefer white a lot of chili. Wow. Yeah. Why you like white? Mm, used to eat black one because I'm Teochew. Yeah, so, so Teochew like with uh, the sweet sauce. Yeah. So that's why they like the black one. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it's maybe when it, when it's sweet sauce when you add chili, it doesn't taste so spicy. But I like it spicy. I'm Pranakan, so. Oh, okay, so okay. so. I like it spicy. So when it's white and you use put out chili, it tends to be a bit more spicier. Like oh, so. okay. So you're a white, uh, white carrot cake yep. with lots of chili. chili yeah. So where's your favorite place to get carrot cake? Carrot cake, uh, actually at Budut and Change, where I where I where I where I live. Um, I live at Budut South. So Budut and Change. Uh, if you if you are Budut person, you will know. Or even in the east, you know Budut and Change has a nice uh, Chai Lao Kui store. So that's I would say uh, a very good one in the. But if you live in the western part of Singapore, yeah, me, Boon Lay Market is also a very nice Chai Lao Kui store. Uh, this uh, lady uh, and her hubby and her sister runs this store. And I, I when I was in Boon Lay, I, uh, because I, I'm there like four or five days a week. So on Sunday mornings, I'll go there and eat her Chai Lao Kui. So if you are in the western part of Singapore, try Boon Lay Market. We are Eastern, but don't change. Oh, not bad, ah. Uh. He still give you West and East, eh? Wow. Yeah, to be to be to be kind and correct with the <laughs> different part. If you in the north, um, okay lah. I reserve comments on the north. <laughs> north, north, maybe not so famous as Chalakui. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Late, uh, wow, later, wow. later, you see all your comments being posted. <laughs> later, hey, you who say who say north don't have uh. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, yeah, but if you have comments also, right? Please pop uh, pop them into the YouTube live chat. Or if you have questions, do that over there because we will actually ask your questions later during uh anytime during the show, actually. So okay, so uh, anyway, right, for those of you who are wondering, oh, all these recommendations that uh Patrick is actually sharing now, right? Uh, how can I get and find? Don't worry, because after this show, uh sometime you maybe tomorrow we'll compile. Yeah, okay. I will compile all his food recommendations. Okay, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and then if Boon May also have. Yeah. But I'll consolidate everything and then we'll share with you so that you can uh find out where these places are and also support our local hawkers. Yes, that's uh, right. Who is struggling support during local. this time right now. Because actually, to be honest, right, even though um um the eating packs have increased, right, but I don't see that many people out. No, I, I was just at Budo Interchange Hawker Center. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm there like at almost every week, la. I mean, yeah. because I mean, I, I rotate lah. Depends on which part of. Oh, which part you support? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm there moving around. So uh, when I work from home, I, I go to the Buddha Change to buy uh, the packed food, either lunch or dinner back. Yeah. And uh, and 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 the, the hawker tells me that the business has been not so, uh, would have been better. Yeah. Because either people are cooking, I, yeah, because they work from home. Like, I think the default is also because it's still work from home, right? Yeah. yeah. So so there are less footfall in the hawker centers. Yeah. I mean now, I mean the last couple of weeks was two persons. Now to, I mean the last few days five now a bit better, um, but. Still, still, their business has been affected quite a bit. The mm. hawkers, yeah, yeah. Because actually, just now when I when I took a cab to office, right, uh, the taxi driver, the cab uncle, he was actually saying like, oh, actually, he went to eat uh out just now. Because I mean, they they are out every yes, day, yes. so they would know. So he was saying that actually the hawkers, uh, the hawker centers right now are actually still very empty. And I think it's also because you know when it's uh default work from home arrangements, then people don't go out as much. Yep. Still, so you yeah. probably pack some things or some frozen food from the supermarket yeah. and cook at home or. Back, you know, buy for the week and all stuff right, like that. Right. And because we've we've already like um how do you say we've gotten used to how things are, right? So we are really prepared this time, you know, we will go grocery shopping, yes. and then we cook for the week, that kind. Especially you know, when we have big families, because uh, my family is quite big, uh, so at the beginning last time when we had to tap all food, right? Very expensive to tap all every day. Because there are like six of us at home. Uh, yeah, so uh, after that, yeah. like every week. No, when the family is big, it's 
better to cook yeah, at home and correct. more economical and you know. yeah. So us for one, we we don't order as much because too many yeah. mouths to feed. It's about every day lunch, dinner. Wow. Uh, some more even different orders, <laughs> yeah, different wow. shops. Some more. <laughs> Let me fly away. Okay, but yeah. Anyway, so uh, we'll move oh. on to the next food later. But now let's talk about a different topic. Okay. Uh, so, so far we've been talking about financial literacy mm. and how it's evolved over the years. Let's now shift gears and talk about the workplace. Mm, okay, so, important. yeah. And I know uh, you're all for the labor movement. Yes. So, COVID-19 has inevitably affected the way uh, we work and the way our companies and businesses Definitely. operate, yeah. correct? So, um, I want you to share your insights into what the new normal in Singapore is currently in terms of the workforce, the workplace and work in general. Yeah. You hit the, the right three W's. <laughs> uh. Yeah, work, workforce, and workplace. I think mm. uh, in this new normal, actually, I wouldn't call it new normal. It's the next normal. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in terms of workforce, uh, you, we all know um, a few things are happening. In fact, in fact, before COVID-19, you we, in Singapore, we have a big challenge. Mm. Uh, firstly, we have an aging workforce. Yeah. I mean, uh, one in four will be about 65 and not too far away, a distant yeah. future. So that's one big challenge. Second, as I alluded to earlier, we are having more and more with uh, many platform workers and uh, now you have, uh, you know, private hire vehicle uh, drivers, etc, etc, uh, and more gigs to, to do. Uh, so you have a, a, a sudden increase in the number of freelance and self-employed workers. Right. So you don't have just aging workers, you have more freelance and self-employed workers. And the third, third, third thing that's happening also into our workforce is that uh, we're getting more white-collar workers uh, simply because in Singapore, many of our Singaporeans have uh, progressed, mm. yeah, uh, and and many of, in fact, uh, a large majority are now in IHLs, institutes of higher learning, IT, poly, or even university, and and even if you are not in IT, poly, or university, uh, you would have taken some of these skills future programs, yeah. and there are many causes and whole whole spectrum and plethora of causes yeah. for you to take, uh, take take on and pick up new skills and competencies. So actually, in terms of skills, abilities. Uh, and and of course, being very digitalized and with a lot of information uh, come overload, uh, uh, more and more people are getting more educated. So one big profile change is our, our workforce is becoming more uh, of white collar, i.e., the professionals, managers, executives, and technicians, PMETs. Uh. Yeah. So so if you look at if you look at our sing, uh, our uh, local workforce, if you look at PMETs, it's something like 59, 60 percent, almost going to become two thirds. Mm. And uh, if you minus a T, which are technicians, we are associate engineers and, and assistant engineers, um, you have something like almost 40%, 39%, 40%. So you can see, actually, our workforce profile is going to be changing quite rapidly. Mm. And uh, more educated, more literate, uh, more uh, skilled workforce is good. Yeah. Uh, but but also means that, uh, you know, we, uh, well, the, 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 the things that, the way we do things, the way we deliver services and the demands and whether we can feel some of these demands in the in the workforce will be will be uh, uh, will have new and exacting challenges because of the profile change. So that's the workforce. Um, in, in in if you look at uh, the nature of work, well, uh, we can see uh, for ourselves uh, what COVID is. Even prior to COVID, we were talking about smart nation, a very very digitalized. Yeah. Um, we're talking about industry 4.0. We're talking about you know workforce 4.0. We're uh, you know, all, all in the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, in fact, all these conversations were prior to COVID-19. Right. And we are already on this big journey, not just in Singapore, but, you know, countries, in neighboring countries, as well as across the globe. So everyone was, everyone was so busy with transformation. We talk about industry transformation maps. Uh, everyone talking about digitalization, digital transformation. So we are already quite uh, into that. Uh, so many companies were actually trying to transform already, even prior to COVID. But I think what happened in the last 15 months is kind of like, accelerated everything yeah. that we wanted to do. I mean, uh, who, I mean, for one period of time, everybody was like skeptics of e-learning. And uh, what have you is uh, in, in, in the last 15 months is that, well, you have no choice. Now home-based learning is synonymous <laughs> to everyone. Right. And uh, e-learning or blended learning is like the order of the day. Mm. And, uh, and, and therefore, our consumption of e-services, uh, this low-touch economy, and, and the very digitalized environment uh, has so-called taken all of us uh yes it's, it's been a movement that we wanted to achieve uh, say within a decade but yeah. the year has caused all of us to be so savvy now we are traced together and everyone is so you know so so savvy and uh, know how to navigate all this stuff uh, much much better but of course the the challenge is also uh, there are some people who are left behind yeah. 
Yeah, so we talk about income equality, right? Now we have digital inequality. Mm. Uh, people who are a bit not so digitally, technologically savvy uh, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Mm. Uh, um, so, so I think that that's where we need to pay a bit more attention to. Yeah. Uh, so that's where um, the labor movement, we are partnering companies and to, to see how we can uplift them mm. and, uh, and through training, skills upgrading. And, and sometimes it's not just the individual. I mean, the employers must provide the support, the ecosystem uh, yeah. to, to, to allow uh, the workers to feel comfortable, pick up new skills and give them some uh, uh, bandwidth to do it, and give them some leeway and space to do it and support them in that journey. Not easy, yeah? yeah uh, because recently, I went to take a Skills Future program. Wow. Again, recently. Which one, which one? Yeah, I, I, I did this program. I don't mention the name of the company. Oh, okay, but okay. Uh, but it, it was because I was trying to understand the financial sector a bit right. better. I heard there's this new growth area. So I, with my own money and time, I, I took on this Skills Future program and then went for a three-day course. Mm. And, uh, and mind you, I, at, a, at the last day of the course, they said, no, next week, there's a multi, there's an there's a, there's a exam. Oh. Part one is one hour, 40 MCQ. Part two is another hour. You have like finished like five, four or five essay questions. Oh, wow. That's it. Wow. So your exam. Huh? Yeah. Then, uh, the, well, well the, the, the thing that tipped the scale was the, 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 the course administrator said, uh, for the MCQ part, uh, it's really online and then the real exam format. Uh, and uh, you have 40 questions within an hour. And if you get less than 70%, you you had to pay us back all the funding that you... Whoa, wow, wow. And, th and that's about $6,000. Oh, wow. wow. So, so okay, because now the funding for a lot of programs yeah. are very, very generous, about 90%. I'm an older worker. <laughs> so they get an enhanced funding. So 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 I, I did the program. I, I, I barely scraped. I passed. Wow, it was a relief, man. Wow. Really a relief. Uh, because it's, the score is contemporaneous, you no? Know? After you finish, you click OK, uh, the score comes out. Did they disclaim at the beginning that there was already like an exam? Or was it something they, that... they said there'll be a, a kind of like an exam, but I didn't know that you they must get at least 70%. You need know? to pay. If you... Yeah, you, you need to pay back, you know. Most of them are funded by companies. I was funding out of my own pocket. <laughs> so, well, a bit wow. of a pinch, you know, if you had to like yeah. fork out everything. So, like, but, so, but actually that three day and exam uh, made me learn something, you know. It's not that easy to pick up skills. I was yeah. going to do something which was quite new. Um, really a new area for me. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and having to learn some of the, the, the skills and the information and having to dissect them. Mm. Oh, uh, I can imagine you know, if, I, if my, I'm facing this problem, what about the many, many mature workers and mature PMEs who are having to go through a program? Mm. So actually, it's not easy. So that's why I said the importance of employers to support and, yeah. and, uh, and look out for and, and give them some leeway and some encouragement. Wow. And uh, so you keep an open mind. I mean, this is a tip for workers out there keep an open mind. Mm. Um, there are actually a lot of, I mean, I, I, I dare say that the, the, the program funding this period of time is very, very generous. generous. So make full use of it, uh, pick up some new information, new skills, and uh, to stay re ready, relevant, and resilient. I always like to use this 3R. Three, no? three, R's, three R's and three W's. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and last one, last one, you want to ask me about work, workforce, oh, and the workplace. workplace. Yeah, so workplace now, you know, we are all, uh, we, you know, you have circuit breaker, they have two H A, three H A, and W F H. Now it's W F A, no. <laughs> Work from anywhere. So, so, so. Um, I think the 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 whole concept of workplace. Uh, if if we, if you ask me, I won't. I can can safely tell you, it won't be business as usual. It won't be back to what we pre COVID days. I think it's yeah. going to be a really next normal, um, because uh, of this very low touch kind of environment, and where possible. Um, even if it becomes endemic, you know, uh, I think all these safe management measures will still uh, have to exist uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, you are, you know, I mean, Singapore is very globalized. At the same time, also, the way we do things and the way we run businesses uh, will be a bit different. Uh, well, the last 15 months, you see many, many retailers going uh, virtual, uh, more e-commerce platforms coming up. Everyone is buying everything. I mean, I'm also in the culprit. I don't mention which platform <laughs> I buy from, but uh i just realized i i, I spent quite a bit um, buying online uh, well after a while you get, you get a bit of addiction you know uh, addiction because you you find it so easy so convenient and uh, even for the small small things yeah um so um so i think the workplace will change quite tremendously i mean uh prior to COVID, look at banks mm. yeah now you go to the bank you don't you, it's no longer the bank the bank yeah you see a yeah. atm you see a access machine you say coin deposit cash yeah. deposit and so so 
unless you go for like personal financial con- advisory mm. or very, very specialized advice. Otherwise, it's purely machines. And, and most of us are on the app. Yeah, we are now PayLa, PayNow, what, you know, all the various pay- payment platforms. So mm. I think it's a, uh, well, the, the, the way we do things are, is mm. going to change. So as the way we do things and our daily lives change, the workplace will also uh, be quite different. Right. Okay. So, okay, my next question is, you know, even though we're talking a lot about uh, employment or this, I also hope like this show will be able to help people who need some sort of career advice. Mm. So uh, my next question, right, also has to do with one of the slides that uh, we have prepared also for this show. Mm. So in the slides there, it's mentioned that platforms to market skills today are 66% through word of mouth mm. and 49% through direct yeah. liaison. This, this, is, this, this survey we, we did, uh, the labor yeah. movement did, was in particular reference to freelancers. Right. So, so we, we, we did a, we, we, we saw this growing trend towards more freelancers. So we right. actually poll them. So we partner with one of the IHLs to do this. So you can actually, the, the, the link is there, yeah. the bit.ly link is there. So you can actually see the full report. It's available public, publicly. And, uh, yes, uh, and, and when we, when we surveyed many of these freelancers, so that's how they got their business. Uh, right. Mostly by word of mouth and, you know, direct liaison. Correct. So. Uh, my next question will be helping even freelancers and non-freelancers. Mm. So you know, for those of us who may not be the most extroverted or are not that into building relationships or connections at work, you know, you just have to work and then you t- out, like you leave. Mm. You don't you don't, don't care so much about you know uh being chummy with your colleagues, right? So here I mentioned that um sixty six percent is true word of mouth. So yeah. for example, let's say for someone who is not so into building this kind of connections relationships, right? What suggestions do you have for these individuals who face difficulties mm. if like their primary way of really getting employed is through uh, connections? Yeah. So so one one big I wouldn't say warning, yeah, but advice. Uh, <laughs> because uh, we we I mean I, I, I work very closely with many of our, our placement providers or partners like the E2I, our Employment and Employability Institute, as well as Workforce Singapore that runs many career centers, yeah. Careers Connect. Uh, I think one 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 big thing we learn from some of the information data and uh, from the job. Uh, applicants and many of these unemployed retrenched workers who are looking for jobs. Mm. Actually, um, you know, placement is more successful when uh, um, by word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, not just freelancers, uh, even uh, even mm. for for those who are looking for full time employment. Um, it, chances of you get landing a job, especially by word of mouth references, uh, as well as industry networks, uh, are much much more higher as compared to you do a cold call, or just email your CV in. Uh, that that seems to be the trend. Uh, so 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 you have you gave me a very good question. So what if I I don't like networking? Yeah. I don't like. Unfortunately, I mean, uh, if if you want to make sure you stay employed and employable, I think very very important is to have uh, uh, strong networking skills and uh, industry networks. Yeah, I I I was just sharing, you know, uh, some of some of, some uh, you know workers may have to leave uh, the job market or labor market. For a variety of reasons, you yeah. know, uh, looking after family, uh, caring for sick, sickly family members, or for a variety of reasons. Uh, but when they are away for like three, five, eight years, they want to come back. Very, very difficult because they have lost touch with the industry. Right. So it's not just that group of workers, as well as those people who are laid off. But if you have kept uh, close links with your industry, yeah, uh, I mean, you have a whole uh, spectrum of different industries. Like, you know, like those people in the ICT line, they have Singapore Computer Society. Mm. Like you have an engineer, yeah, institution of engineers. Yeah. So so actually they are almost network of people, like-minded people, same craft, same occupation, same profession, same skills. And uh, and uh, and and it's important to stay connected to these networks. Right. Um attend their webinars, yeah, and uh, attend their events. I think they, they have been very quite proactive in organizing some of the events. Mm. Yeah. Full spectrum, you know, even HR, HR have their own HR communities yeah. and associations, even the legal community. I mean, besides law society, there's Singapore Corporate Council Association, the accountants have, have groups, uh, even architects have groups, uh, even marketeers have groups, even admin professionals have groups. Yeah. So I think it's good to stay connected uh, with the industry so that you don't lose touch. I mean, lose touch in the variety of knowing what skills are in demand, what are the job openings, mm. uh, because uh, the word of mouth is quite strong. Right. I think not just uh, you know in, in doing business and and sales, but also in in, in job search. So, uh, well, we, we see employers actually value a lot more uh, word of mouth references mm. and and the people who are already connected to the network. Yeah. Uh, not 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 that you need to rub shoulders with people high up, you know. But essentially, you you are, you know what's happening in the industry, so that even if we go for interview, 
uh, the, the questions are thrown at you on, on that industry that you're joining or that mm. company, uh, you are not uh, you are not lost. Right. You're, you're able to connect and say, oh, these are the trends I see. Um, these are things you need to do. So, so it's important. So sometimes if you really can't uh, be part of a, a network or association, then another way is go for training. Mm. So through training, actually, you, you meet like-minded people in the industry yeah. uh, and, and also get to know people as well. That's why like I attended a three-day course, so at least I know a few more people <laughs> Uh, in, 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 space. in in that space right. matter. Okay. Actually, yeah, uh, I think groups really matters because sometimes uh, you do not know what you don't know also. But through being in the group, right, then you realize the, uh, what, what other people know about certain uh, whatever they're interested in, right? And then you get to, I wouldn't say leech, but you you, you are more self-aware mm. of what, what kind of information there is out there. So even like, you know, just like what you mentioned about groups, right? So I remember last, sometime around this year, last year, we actually did a city TV just for freelancers. Mm. And that was because uh, one of the freelancers group uh, on Facebook reached out to us and asked oh. whether or not we could do something like that for them. Nice. Yeah, so uh, that may not necessarily um, help in them getting a job, you know, because there weren't like job opportunities that we were offering. But at least we managed to cover career advice and like tips on how mm. they can navigate such an uncertain uh, period during uh, one year ago back during when COVID-19 and Circuit Breaker just happened. Yes. Yeah. So really being in groups, right, will, will help you in more ways than you actually imagine that it would be. Yeah. So, right. so, you know, no man is an island. I think yeah. it's important to, to hunt as a pack and to look out for one another in the community, in mm. associations, in groups, even in volunteer uh, communities as well. All right, because I think in the past, it's very, it's, it's still, um, you can still survive if you are just very competent in what you do. Mm. But like these days, right, um, there are a lot of more, uh, there, are, there are a lot of other factors that employers actually look at yeah. other than just uh, your competencies, yeah, like the ability, ability to, to work with people. Collaborate. Yeah. I mean, the key word now, you know, besides communication is co ability to collaborate. Right. So the other C is collaborate, yeah. Yeah, so uh, being in groups and like-minded groups will help. So for those of you who need some sort of like a career guidance, that could be one of the ways that you can actually uh, get some direction. Actually, there are some of these workshops that are available as well. Mm. And, uh, and you know, if, if uh, for Singaporeans, they're actually the skills future credit. So yeah. some of these mature PMEs want to take on some of these transition, career transition programs, employability camps. Yeah, they are readily available and you can sign up for them and uh, they are almost, almost cost-free. Right. Okay, yeah, and, and on our end, right, for example, uh, we actually have um, Ask Me Anything sessions with WSG quite often. Okay, great. Yeah, great. so actually we have one that's upcoming in a few weeks. So if you have questions, you know, usually they target a certain sector. So the last time that we did was actually the ICT sector. Oh, yes. So like this time around, we might do a different sector. So uh, tune in, I mean, stay tuned and follow our socials if you'd like to know when the next AMA, uh, the Ask Me Anything sessions with WSG will be and you can ask them your career-related questions. Great. Okay, another question I have, going back to that slide, right? Mm. So I also see that you know you, uh, this is like more of like sharing about what new ways mm. of working will be and you know it shows there that um 83 percent appreciate a flexible work schedule mm. now this uh okay i have something to say so for example you know we we now know that you know the working from home is actually possible i yeah. don't necessarily need to go to the office that's right, right. So Remember, when... <laughs> this survey is done before COVID 19. Oh. so therefore before that uh, now, it might be man, higher, right? uh, now now well <laughs> I, I, I dare not to make a guess right. because it's a mixed bag. Right. Um, I think some people prefer working from home. Uh, so working from home, yeah, yeah. Uh, it may be easy for some, may not be easy for others. Yeah. So so it, it's a mixed bag. Correct. So I get mixed uh, sensing, you know, particularly during the circuit breaker and the 2HA, 3HA. Yeah. Um, well, different groups of people um, work differently. I mean, there are exacting demands working from home. It's not easy. Uh. Yeah. Uh, I, I see more fatigue cases, including myself. Uh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Are you watching boss? Yeah, I'm like, like, I'm like on the laptop day, the night, you know. Mm. Uh, and and we're still now if we connect to people in different time zones. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember doing one uh, call, and it was like 10 p.m. because over there is afternoon in Europe, you know. Mm. Yeah. So so things like that. So so I think that's the the one big challenge. Correct. So now that we know that um, like working from home and working with office in both ways, we can still get the work done. So my next question would be, do you foresee the willingness to work from home or not uh, to be a key consideration that both employers and employees need to come uh, together to have like a common understanding before they do hiring? Yeah, I think, I think it depends on the sector the, and, and the mm. industry as well as the company and the nature of the work that's being done. Right. Uh, because uh, different industry, yeah, different uh, companies, uh, different job scopes also yeah. uh, require different uh, work arrangements. Correct. 
Correct. So it all depends. I mean, some you really need face to face. You have no choice. I mean, those that can be done from Correct. home. Correct. Yeah. So you have your you know in in, in the financial institutions they call it the front office, middle office, back office. You know? Yeah. So some really you, you really need to uh, to be there. Uh, maybe perhaps for example, like you're accessing certain confidential data. For example, you can't bring it home and then. But of course now you have all the security settings and everything else. Um, but but uh, there may be some like for example like it's our essential services workers. They they can't work from home. Yeah. But they need to deliver the essential service. So they are actually twenty five percent of them during circuit breaker at the front lines and you know at the trenches, uh, looking after all of us. So so it depends. I think it depends on sector, depends on industry, also depends on companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether it's a big company or a small company. When you are big, well, you can do a team A, team B, sometimes even team C. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But but if you're re- relatively small and you're re- very operational, for example, mm. so every man counts. I mean, uh, if you're running a F and B outlet, for example, uh, yes, I can uh, I can have minimal headcount, but uh, really sometimes when the business is brisk, you really need an extra person to to help out, whether it's uh, or, 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 you know, serving customers or yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah, so I think the sector matters because yeah. uh, back then I was doing radio as well, right? Uh, you really, as in we, we could still do teams A and B, we just don't meet each other as much, but the equipment is there and, you're, and you need that's right, that's equipment right. in order to broadcast mm. uh, radio. So yeah, just certain sectors, uh, working from home is flexi, and it's doable, but not for every sector. I think mm. that's something that you need to take note as well if mm. uh, you're considering of uh, working from home arrangements. Yeah. Okay. One question that uh, came in by Max Lim, four-day work week is the norm in Iceland now. Do mm. you foresee this being the case in Singapore uh, in years to come? Yeah, I, I remember, <laughs> well, slightly about 20 years ago, uh, we were six, five and a half-day week, work week. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember vividly because I was part of that uh, discussion and uh, feedback process. I remember it was in the, it was the remaking Singapore committee like eighteen years ago, mm-hmm. uh, where we, we started thinking through it, and then finally the, uh, one of the recommendations of the remaking Singapore committee was, can we go on five day work week? Right. Uh, so that's where the entire civil service after that because it's a nice deck of recommendations <laughs> submitted all the way up, uh, they made it a five day work week, and then everyone had to adjust, mm. and uh, and and of course Employment Act says you know forty four hour per week you know, overtime maximum, yeah. 72 hours a month and all these uh, requirements. Uh, whether it's four days, well, there are companies that go on four days. Um, it, it, against, again, uh, impinges on the point of flexibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, net, you need to do the X number of hours. Mm. Um, you know, like in France, for example, uh, they are even less than 40 hours a week. And uh, they are as equally productive as Singaporeans. Yeah, so how and why? Um, so, so the the question we get is, uh, is is work hours the, the the necessary the determinant of output? Yeah. So I think I think that's the 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 moot point uh, that uh, we are still grappling with. Uh, but so far, I mean, it varies. There are companies actually because of my work in the labor movement. There are companies where there's a bit more intense. The nature of work more demanding, more physically strenuous. It's only a forty hour work week. There are mm-hmm. some. I mean, I won't reveal which company or sector, but there are some sectors because of the nature of the work. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 uh, if if that can be that, and, and some I know work two on two off, and then some mm. work only four days a week because yeah. they work eleven hours a day. Right. So I think the key word is flexibility. I think something that we are trying to like propound or lobby for, and advocate for. And I'm glad, uh, you know, before COVID nineteen, all the employers say, oh, cannot cannot make it You know, you, you can't do flexible work arrangements. Uh, so we were like really going uh, uphill task, you no, know, really going against the tide. But after distance. COVID, you know, everyone looks around and says, actually, everything is possible. Yeah. When you are put into that, that spot, yeah. you have no choice. Yeah. Um, uh, and, 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 and therefore, it's possible. Flexibility is possible. So I think there's, there's a greater acceptance of flexibility today as compared to, you know, exactly, say, 15 months ago, when we talked about flexible work arrangements. Right. And I think because we started also with a six-day six day work week, and then it went to five day work week. So who knows? You know, four day work week could possible, be. Possible, possible. In fact, some companies are doing like you come in the office two days. Oh yeah. And then three days you you work from home. And then uh and end of, and at the end of the day is how the company is able to to set their key performance indicator, the deliverables and uh, the appraisal, so that you know it's a fair system. You want to be ob- as objective as possible. Right. Yeah. So where possible, uh not just work hours, but but also, if you if you have very clear goals or specific targets or indicators, yeah. then uh, the whole concept of number of hours becomes irrelevant. Right. 
Yeah, but however, the, the, my only caveat is well, some services where we require, uh, for example, essential services, you can't, uh, if you have lesser, lesser work, means someone else picking up the, the, the slack. Right. So I think that that's the, the important part to appreciate. Okay, wow. Okay, that, that was a very, uh, that was a long part for career. So in the meantime, while you're asking your questions, remember to just do us on the YouTube live chat. But now it's a... Uh, can make things a bit more fun again. Okay, got food. Okay. Food again. Uh, what, can you guess? The food is getting cold. Food? Yeah, <laughs> I know. But can we guess? Can you want to guess what's the next food that we uh, that we have? He has rice. And he has, <laughs> I see he has rice and he has chicken as well. <laughs> okay, it's chicken rice. Okay. Wow. Jing, jing, jing. Chicken rice. Okay. Wow. Chicken rice. Let's see. Uh. The okay, one, so the one on your advert advertorial was white chicken. Yeah. And soy sauce. Hey, wow. Yeah, this is the soya sauce yeah the soya one. sauce one or like yoti. Okay, so uh, this one can you guess the price? Okay, I I I maintain uh, <laughs> three fifty. Yeah, always fifty cents different. <laughs> Four dollars. Four dollars. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. Okay, but wow. so if it's chicken rice, uh, what what kinds do you eat? Do you usually eat like white, uh, roasted, or like this one the soya mm. sauce one? Actually, I don't mind chicken rice, but I prefer char siu and roast duck. Why you like that? I give you chicken rice and tell me. No, la, I mean to tell you the truth. Out. Uh my two favorite foods, uh, uh let your insist you're talking about food. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice break from all the hard yeah, topics. Man. Uh it's actually um char siu and roast duck rice. And uh, the other my, my favorite satay. Yeah. Wow. And specific places among the dive. No one share. Oh share, yeah. No, no, when you say it like that, or you yeah, cannot stop yeah, there. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, we need to know. Must, must give you a bit of background. Okay. This char siu and roast duck, uh, what's so unique? Actually, actually, it's when I was young, I mean, really like 40 not years ago, young, uh, no. now 50, 40 years ago, <laughs> but they always bring me to this char siu uh, and, uh, and rose duck store somewhere in Waterloo Street. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the store is still there, I think, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I, I don't go there too often these days, but since young, I uh, always buy this char siu and this rose duck from there. I love it. Uh. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the, that, that taste sticks in me, you know. I mean, my dad passed on when I was uh, in final university. So sometimes I, I, it's a bit nostalgic and brings back memories of my younger days with him. So so uh, this this guy who runs this store, uh, one of the apprentices now sets up a shop in Block 69, Budok South. <laughs> uh, very, very near where I live. Don't tell you where I live, but nearby. So I still patronize it today quite, quite frequently. Uh, the rose, my, my kids also love it. Um, it's the Rose Duck and Cha Siu store at Block 69 corner nearer to the bus stop. Yeah, so if you uh, if you are thinking of char siu, or, I think they close quite early lah. So by now, I think you 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 won't get it. You probably end by like seven thirty. So so they sell like late morning to more mid morning to evening. Ooh. So that's a very nice char siu roast duck. The other one I like is satay actually. Satay I usually get from Newton uh, food Newton, center. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I love this satay. Uh, uh well I I must get a you know a commission from the from Akong. <laughs> his, his, his name is Akong Satay, you no. Know? <laughs> So it's, it used to be a uh, Geylang Lorong 29 next to the famous Chaco Hokkien Mee store. La. Yeah. Uh, also, I have been eating there like since I was a young kid. Actually, I started eating the Hokkien Mee first, la, the fried Hokkien Mee, not the, the soups kind, of, the fried one. It's Chaco la, till today. And then the store next to it was a satay. But then now he, he, the owner told me the, they want to increase his rent or something like that. Oh. So he shifted to the next Lorong. I think if not 27 or 25. So it's just at the corner there, and uh, it's called Akwong Satay. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's good uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, is it the sauce? or uh, Both. Oh, wow. The meat is very generous portions. Uh, and the sauce, you have the pineapple. Yeah, because you know, sometimes the satay you know, the, or, the pineapple, or the tanginess, uh, yeah, is no, it? No, no. They add this pineapple. Where? The crunch, uh, uh, In the sauce? Yes. Oh. So you have the peanut sauce, and then you add the, the pineapple crunched up or, 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 or mashed up. You know? Oh, it's like the they call it the Hainani style of a uh, uh, sat satay mm. So uh, so these two are my so called uh, comfort food. Oh wow! So yeah. satay and chashu roast duck. Mm. <laughs> I remember. Oh, hey, but this is the first time I hear I hear that uh, I heard that uh, so the first time I, I'm hearing that there's actually peanut sauce with pineapple. Yeah, pineapple gravy or not? There there, are, there is available across Singapore la, mm. in in various parts of Singapore. Yeah. Uh, even your favorite hawker center also has it. Uh, I don't let her tell you where is it, but uh, it's available because it's a Hainani style, so yeah. To speak. yeah. Oh, okay. So okay. So if it's chicken rice, uh, it's not really his preference. But if you have to pick between soya sauce, white chicken, and roasted chicken, white, 
white. Yeah. But a bit cold, right? White chicken usually very I don't cold. know. I think the the the, the, what, the, the like, winning move of a chicken rice like, is the rice and the chili. <laughs> you just, <Yeah. laughs> the chicken <laughs> is there. And then you talk about the rice. Yeah. Hey, but he really likes his chili. You see, he, he mentioned chili. Yeah, so I, I, chili I'm the Teochew okay. Peranakan, you know. Peranakan is like, I'm synonymous. I I, I remember this Ho Fan store near... <laughs> Uh, that I buy from sometimes, you know, uh, because I can call and then uh, the, the, they prepare it. Uh, then I always ask for a lot of green chili. Then they say, you you eating hofa, you eating green chili. <laughs> yeah, it's like scoops and scoops. And then I think the, the boss was angry with me. Yeah, because you cannot uh, taste the natural taste of their hofa. It's that sour green chili taste. <laughs> That's why. Hey, yo, okay. But you know, in the meantime, before we have our last hawker food that we will talk about later, uh, let's look at some of the questions that the community have, has uh, has actually asked previously. Okay, so this one is actually by uh, our very own co-founder of Sydney, Kenneth. Oh, okay. Hi, so, Kenneth. <laughs> he <laughs> asked, right, uh, do you think that the public sector are still capable of attracting the brightest talent over compared to the private sector who is a lot more competitive uh, in challenge and overall benefits? I think... Uh, since you know you are in some in one way or another like in the yeah. public sector, right? What do you think about this? I, I think I think the the challenges, the problems, and also the uh, it's it's not never going to end. I think it's constantly a, a battle for talent, particularly in Singapore, because you know our local res, uh, Singaporean workforce is shrinking. Yeah. Uh, with the aging population, and of course our fertility rates at one point one four last year doesn't help. So we have a smaller workforce. So I, I think also I can see the government also trying to like free up talents on the public sector to the private sector. Mm. So they, they'll try to achieve a balance. Mm. Not, not try to like attract try, everyone yeah. in the public sector, you know, uh, and then you know, compromise the private sector. So I think that they'll try to achieve a balance. Yeah. yeah I, and I think more young people these days want to do things uh, for cause, for purpose. And uh, some, some of them can connect with what the public sector does. Mm. And they, they, they think that through the public sector, uh, they can make a difference. So I think it depends on individual passions, interests, and inklings. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, your, your, in, your interested subject area. Right. Yeah, because if, let's say the private sector can better fulfill your that, you know, passion and interest, then uh, they would have cho- chosen that. Uh, so, so I think our young people are m- much more astute and uh, be able to make better judgment and decisions than you n- ever know. Because they have so many options. And uh, now you have freelance options as well. Yeah. yeah and then you have a growth, a big growth of startups. So I think uh, it's going to be a challenge for the public sector, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Finding the good talents. But at the same time, also, I think the public sector appreciates that they need to achieve a balance. Right. Actually, I think what you're saying is now these days, actually, we have more choices than we don't. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, for that question, he has answered very nicely. Another, another question that we have, uh, how can young PMEs pivot and survive in a post-COVID world? Uh, do you think COVID has a long-term effect on our career progression and factors like salary? I think one way that like you mentioned just now, right, is through uh, upskilling. But uh, what are other ways that uh, you know, PMEs especially, yeah, you know? I, I think personally, you know, having, I told you, uh, ran through a, a program recently. Yeah, and you really know like firsthand the struggles of yeah, I mean, no, and learning something. I, I, I felt I had to do it because like try to go against like your normal. It's like you know you have already like a paradigm paralysis, and you try to like get <laughs> out of your paradigms. So so try to do that, and uh, so so I think it's it's easier said than done. I know I'm I'm telling you this, but you say ah yeah no he is ne- he's not in our position or no, he's not unemployed he's not retrenched. How will you know how I how I feel? But uh, because of my many interactions with many of uh, my friends, classmates, old friends, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's definitely challenging um, because uh, it's a very uneven kind of recovery, very uncertain as well. We don't know what's going to pan out mm. tomorrow. And, uh, and therefore, I think the, the key thing is, uh, uh, you know, I, I, back to the three R's again. <laughs> uh, yeah, stay ready, relevant and resilient. Yeah. I think very, very important. I think it's more like personal attributes. Mm. Yeah, ready, we talk about skilling. Uh, ready, because you know the, the, the new kind of jobs that are coming out mm. are very, very different from the jobs prior to COVID-19. I mean, yeah. Uh, who ima- imagine there's something called safe distance ambassadors? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who imagine you know uh, e-commerce is going to be so big and everyone's going to be like on the digital platforms, right. and and so so being ready with the skills to be able to na- uh, navigate very important, and of course being relevant mm. because uh, as you know as I shared earlier our work workplaces are all transforming. Mm. You com- every company is trying to pivot, trying to re-strategize, reorganize, and trying to see what's the next winning move. So like so yourself also need to stay relevant uh, to these new jobs and openings and opportunities. Right. And finally, the most important, resilient. 
uh, easier said than done. Uh, you know, if you take the typical dictionary definition of resilient, means you know you will feel you are able to bounce back uh, more easily. So being resilient is is, uh, is very very important. And uh, and after having gone through that program, I think um, very important to keep an open mind. Mm. Yeah, and and uh, know that uh, and stay positive. Uh. Particularly during this period when everything around you is negative, uh, I think uh, positivism helps. Yeah, have a positive state of mind because uh, as we are talking, I, I also quite concerned because I, I do see in my community, particularly work from home and and all the exacting stress stresses of work, uh, work from home, and in the community we see neighborly disputes, we yeah. see people all having fatigue, including us, mental fatigue. Uh, and mental fatigue is fine, mm-hmm. but when all these stresses get manifested in like you know, ill health and then uh, and, and all sorts of manifestations, uh, sometimes even uh, mental disorder, mm. that's where the, 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 the worry uh, you know, comes. So, so very important uh, during this period of time as we are trying to stay ready, relevant, resilient, and at the same time, keep an open mind uh, also to stay healthy, not just physically, but mentally. Mm. Actually, when you mentioned that, uh, I also wanted to talk about, like, for example, how uh, being uh, working from home is not a default, right? It also means that everyone's more um, at home you know, it also means that you see your neighbors more often. Yeah. Like, you know, when, okay, for example, in your SMC, do you see like a rise in uh, neighbor tensions? Yes, yes. I, I, I do see a rise in neighbor disputes uh, because, uh, you know, uh, simply because everyone's at home. Mm. Yeah, you can imagine, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you have extended family at home, yeah, not just uh, your own new family nucleus, but your siblings, siblings, spouses, children, or even uh, three, four generation families. Yeah. And uh, and everybody's working from home. Everybody's on home based learning, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's it's real challenge. Uh, but particularly, I mean, I I've seen, uh, you know, some of the friends and and colleagues uh, who are having to operate sometimes, you know, from the kitchen, from the bedside, and from, uh, various corners that they can find, uh, so that they they have a, at least a decent looking uh, background, uh, on Zoom or MS Teams. So I think I think these are some of the exacting challenges of working from home. And, uh, and and it's going to be different for different people. Mm. That, that is me. My colleagues always, because uh, uh, my siblings are at home, my parents are at home also. So for example, like I share rooms with my sister, right? So like she's using the room, so I'm working in the living room, but I'm also sharing that space with my dad. And also when we, we have both have, uh, when we both have meetings during the same time, I need to find some random corner at home to do like uh, my meeting. So my colleagues always ask like, what is this new corner that you're at right now? Because <laughs> I always have to find random space. But it's really because it's a bit frustrating sometimes because it's, it's very it's very disruptive like, when you yeah, work. But I right. guess, you know, uh, as you just need to adapt more. Like, so, so let's say if all these exacting demands, uh, I mean, yeah. tensions uh, arise. And uh, we have, previously when you are out for more than 10 hours a day, <laughs> right? Now you're at home and then, yeah. and uh, I, got, I get one of my residents, you know, complain about neighbours. Like, you know, the kids are like jumping, 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 making noise. I mean, all kids jump and make noise, right? Yeah. I mean, young children. So, so, but... I can can understand how he feels because yeah. uh, he's he's at home, um, and you're here. Of course, uh, if you're not like, working from home, people are, else uh, smokers are also working from home, so they smoke and the smoke goes out of the windows and then you know it, mm. it diffuses and goes to, to to different parts of the estate, and then you get some of this secondhand smoke. So that's where all these tensions come up in the community. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, let's move on to another question. So this one was very, very this person knows about you. Huh? Wow. So, uh, I see he, that, he has checked out my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, I see that you've studied in NTU, NUS and SMU, all of which are top universities in Singapore. You've also been to Harvard Business School, which is often perceived as a prestigious global university. How different was it studying locally and overseas? Uh, basically, this person wants to get your thoughts mm. on the education mm. system that we have in Singapore versus overseas. Having yeah. done both, right? Yes. Uh, what would you, uh, would you recommend, for example, youngsters mm. to study overseas? Because, I mean, for me myself, I think our education system is very, it's, it's, it's a good one already. You don't necessarily need to go to overseas to really have a very well-rounded education. Yes. But there are experiences that you will be able to uh, get right. along the way from there that you'll never be able to do it here. Mm. Yeah, because you're really like, you know, uh, studying there alone or living there alone. But like, you know, for yeah. someone who, has, who have done both, who has yeah. done both, right, what would you recommend? Actually, I'm a very, very local kind of graduate. I did my first and second degree in law in the NUS. So I spent a big part of my, my, my university education in, in NUS. Uh, but actually, because of uh, attending an executive program, mm. I was on a program 
uh, uh, sort of like a executive leadership program. And that's where, why I spent a bit of time at SMU mm. for a short period for kind of like a, a executive program. And then uh, with NTU is because I'm more of the Lian Fellows, um, you know, where we did some research. So that's why my affiliation with all three universities. But it's only like five, six years ago that I went to uh, HBS, Harvard Business School, uh, you know, to go for this advanced management program. It's just an executive program. It's an eight-week program. It's not a full graduate program, like an MBA or so. It's just an eight-week immersion for senior executives. And uh, if I may compare, I, I, I think the, the quality, the standards of education in Singapore, uh, you know, is on par with, I mean, you see the university rankings, you know. Yeah. We are we're definitely on par. I think I think the, the key uh, takeaway, if I may share, uh, having only had a chance of real overseas education after, say, about more than 25 years, uh, after working for like 20, 25 years, uh, is that I think it, it it opens your mind to new possibilities and networks. Yeah, I think many of you who uh, who who have uh, you know done a stint overseas will realize uh, these days very fortunate. Uh, many of uh, of course now COVID nineteen uh, can travel restrictions, but otherwise uh, during my time uh, thirty years ago there there wasn't so much overseas immersion, mm. overseas um, in, uh, summer programs and, and attachment programs as compared to now. So if you have ever had an opportunity, I think the good thing is to, to mix with different cultures and to understand the different workings in different uh, parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that will put you in good stead uh, in, in that because in Singapore, uh, we, we are very he heavily rely on trade, We're very, very globalized. I mean, the whole world is going to be very, very uh, already very globalized. So if you want to be able to operate and, uh, and, and to move up in, in, in various industries, uh, you need that. Uh, that overseas exposure. I mean, if you have had a chance to do a short stint through various programs, mm -hmm. summer internship, even a one-year industry attachment, and now they have a lot of like work trials and all sorts that they are provided, all oh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, even some of the, the different companies who offer some of these uh, orientations, you just take some time away to, to be with them. Uh, uh, it will put you in good stead so that you better understand the culture, but you'll be dealing and working alongside in teams and groups uh, where you have multi-jurisdictional teams so, so I think uh, that that will, will help you in, in your work and to better appreciate and to move into uh, organizations where it's multinational. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. That, I think that sums up really yeah. uh, very succinctly. Uh, let's look at another question by Andrew Tay. So he's asking, will you foresee more support for our hawkers? COVID definitely brought much hardship for them. Hmm. Uh, what do you think? Yes, uh, there's already quite a few uh, uh, support measures. I know introduced uh, through the, uh, the many rounds of budget. Uh, mm. We have rental release. You have uh, well, there may be some who fall through the cracks. So that's why that's where, uh, locally in the community, we try to help some of these who may have fallen through the cracks because they don't fall within that rental relief or funding formula or framework. So so do approach your local community to see what uh what help is available to support you in that journey, uh, But I I definitely feel that uh, uh we already you know uh, we have already preserved our so called UNESCO hawker culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, batch, so I think uh, definitely this is something we want to preserve and to make sh to make sure that uh, our hawker culture not just uh, is preserved but it thrives. Mm. So uh, it's it's not easy. Uh, I mean, I I've uh, interacted with many of these hawkers, including those who my who cook my favorite food. Uh, they always say, you know, they always complain to me and say, hard to find a. They always say, you know, hard to find a younger generation to do what we do. It's true. Though. Yeah, because it's it's hard work. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard work. I mean, you 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 wake up early in the morning, depending on what kind of food you sell. Yeah, uh, it's long hours, and yeah. uh, and most of the time they are standing up yeah. and in front of the flames, you know. Mm. So you need satay, you're cooking it. The charcoal heat is in front of you for I me. Mean, you have fan, you have exhaust, what have you. But say all you want is still heat in your face, literally for uh, pro prolonged hours. Yeah. Okay, mm. I have another question on career. So, uh, what's your stand on foreign workers in Singapore? Do you think we are overly reliant or have we found the right balance? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is something like that uh, some of you have been following me uh, on <laughs> in Parliament and outside Parliament, something which I'm very passionate about. I think, I think there, there, are, there are some traits or, or, or areas which we, we, we still will still require foreigners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, like some of us need domestic helpers. Yeah, so that, that one, I mean, to care for elderly, to care for young children, uh, we, we still need them. And in certain sectors which uh, which we find very difficult uh, to find Singaporeans to embark on, for example, construction, your tunneling works, your building of your flats and your buildings. These are some, some areas which uh, which we, we, we still will continue to rely yeah. 
on uh, foreign workers to help supplement. Uh, in Singapore, it's one-third, two-third. You have one-third foreign workers and the other two-thirds are Singaporeans, uh, local workforce. So, so it's, 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 uh, the government has come up publicly on this, that this will be the, the, the ratio. Um, but I think, I think a lot of grousers on the ground uh, are actually from the professional management executives. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, I mean, some of you have followed me on Parliament the last couple of weeks. I've been talking about it. I think, I think the key thing is uh, many of the professional management executives, uh, um, they, they, they may have come across instances where in certain sectors, lah, yeah, I don't mind being uh, frank about it, you know, financial sector, ICT, or even professional services, but you have a large concentration on non Singaporeans. So that's where uh, it gets a bit tense. And mm. then uh, the optics are not, is it, why, why so many, you know? Uh, and, then, and worse still, they are affected in terms of uh, they're unemployed, they're terminated, or they lose their jobs. And uh, they see these people still carrying on. And then, you know, actually, I'm more competent than them. You know? mm. So I think the issue is not whether, but, but I think in general, when I, I've been engaging many of the professionals, managers, executives, because I co-chair a task force, NTUC SNEF task force, looking at the concerns, challenges of uh, our PMEs. Uh, I mean, the top of the minds is actually job security. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, it's job security. I think they appreciate that uh, uh, foreign workforce complements the Singapore workforce. I think the key thing, the key word uh, is that things must be fair. Yeah. I think the key word is fairness. I don't think we are complaining that we are being open. I think we know we are complementary. I mean, like sectors of healthcare, yeah. you know, we almost wanted uh, for uh, foreign uh, healthcare professionals. So I, I think they know that uh, the, the treatment should be, the, the foreign workforce is complementary to us, uh, not replacing us. I think that's the key that uh, many of the PMEs want to see. Right. And, and I think uh, the grouse is not, you know, Many of these multinationals bring money, uh, money investments here. I think the grounds is when at a, at a workplace, in terms of hiring, recruitment, layoffs, and treatment of workers, there's some unfairness or some bias, or sometimes even unconscious bias or discriminatory practices. That's where um, you know it tips the skill, and then you you have angry Singaporeans or angry PMEs. So that's that's my sense when I interact with many of them. Mm, okay. Wow. Well. Mm. So that's really like, because he, he does a lot for the labor movement, yes. so he would know best in that in that area. So that's why I'm pushing for like tougher, <laughs> you know, laws to to weed out unfair practices. Not 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 to, to weed, weed out everything, no, but yeah. to weed out unfair practices. I think the key thing is uh, the unfairness. Okay. Wow. Mm. We've gone through a lot today so wow, far. Wow, yeah. That's but right. wait, wait, we're not ending yet. Okay, so let's go with wow. our last uh, hawker food. Uh, any guesses? No no prizes for guessing the right one, but... <laughs> wow, this uh, one, tough has, one. <laughs> it, has, uh, uh, it has peanut. Uh, it's drenched in uh, sweet sauce, I think. Usually it is. Prawn paste sweet sauce. <gasps> ding, ding, ding. It is Roja. Wow, Roja. Wow. wow, this one is tough, eh? Because I don't think I have a favourite Roja place. I Do don't have to. You also don't have, right? Nope. Yeah, this one... I mean, I'm, I'm not a big fan of rojak, but I don't mind it. Yeah. I, I, especially, I like the yu cha kueh. You know, sometimes you have a bit of pineapple. The sinful stuff is the best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, I, but yeah, anyway, this is the one that we got from Chinatown. Can you guess how much uh, it costs? $4. Yeah, $4. Wow. All right, man. <laughs> Finally, got, I got it. got the on the last one. <laughs> Spot on. She tries more yeah. bucks. But it's yeah. quite generous for four dollars, I think. Uh yeah, it's, right. it's it actually depends on the on, on, on where because I think I notice hawker stores these days. Uh, I mean I, I like I said east and west, uh, mm. yeah, in the west like Bunei market, many of the storeholders are actually uh, they own the store. Yeah. Uh, so they don't get they are not like sub sub lease kind of thing. Right. Uh. So so they actually they, they are able to keep the prices quite reasonable. Mm. So that's why you have disparate disparate kind of prices here and there. Mm. Some are uh, you know so they the they, they buy the store then they sublet out and then and that's where it, it builds on to the cost so right. so it varies lah, but it's usually like 50 cents to a dollar two dollar difference correct yeah. yeah but anyway today we've reached the the last hawker food yes. uh, that we've actually bought and got him to guess uh, the prices finally correct <laughs> finally correct on the last one that's the most important thing okay but anyway uh we also have uh, we'll be compiling like a list of his food recommendations later, two only so, uh, two yeah. uh, I can get more so yeah, let me yeah. know later but yeah you know this is something that we will show uh we will actually share with you the community uh sometime maybe uh the next few days but in the meantime right before i want to wrap up this show very nicely mm. let's get to know more about you mm. and i think it will help very well right that i actually have uh the community wow. who actually ask questions also, asking so. personal questions yeah now. man yeah. like i mean like since you're here I might as well do this okay what and how do you get started into politics yeah okay uh, uh yeah, actually amazing work you've done by the way wow, wow. so nice <laughs> thank you thank you whoever that posts that 
But uh, actually, actually, uh, I, I started community work first. Um, it all started many years ago. It's actually about 38, 39 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was a secondary one student. Yeah, I, I live in Bedok. I told you, right, all my life. So, so uh, actually, my mom uh, is a volunteer. Right. Because the, the, the local, now you know, the residence committee, right? The chairperson, the, 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 the RC chairman. Actually, it's my dad's friend. When they go to work together, they take the same bus. They are, their workplaces are next to each other in Pasi Panjang. So they take the same bus number. Mm. So every morning, they were like 7 o'clock, they'll go like, walk to the bus stop together. So they knew each other. Then um, then my dad said, you know, told my mom, so why don't you get help out in the local? Well, they just set up this concept of residence committee in, right. in the 70s, 80s. La. So so that's then and she she volunteered and then uh and 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 as she volunteered and then when my dad became quite ill uh, of sorts uh, uh he had undergo an operation like something when I was P six and sec one kind she of thing over. yeah she kind of like took a back seat in the in the community work and I, I, and uh, the RC chairman knowing me was uh, his son actually my my kind of like childhood friend oh. so so I said okay I like, help out like, well, he said uh, not not enough young people. So I said, hey, but I only sec one, sec two, you know. So I said, never mind, I'm gonna help uh, carry extinguisher, something like a civil event, you know, <laughs> or, or stretcher or some tables and chairs, help us arrange and stuff like that. So I said, okay, lah, then help out, help out. Then uh, then one thing leads to another. Lah. Mm. I mean, of course, I took a kind of like a break during national service, but uh, uh but after that, when I went to university, I continued. Lah. Right. So I've been involved like youth, uh, civil defense in secondary school, and uh, then been involved in all the various community grassroots stuff. Lah. So that that I've been involved with that in many many years until uh, I I I you know then I joined I I started off my work, uh, you know I did law but I didn't be, become a lawyer I, I I started my my career in the police force so I served I was on the bond yeah. so I served six years and then after that uh, uh, joined NTUC yeah. um, and and you know there's just one after quite a number of years in NTUC and then this you know this this. You know, I attend some of these tea sessions. Yeah. And then uh, that's how it all began. Wow. Yeah. So why why do you not okay, so since you said uh, you studied law, right? But why didn't you decide to go with uh being like the usual of like a lawyer instead, but you sign on for police? Yeah, yeah. I I I you know the typical young uh, boys kind of ambition, I want to be a policeman. No? Uh, secondary school I said MPCC. So I said, Oh, I want to be a policeman. Then right. then uh actually the, the most interesting thing is when I went for you know uh, to get in law fact in US is not easy at that time. You know, at that time they had like curb on lawyers, you know? So they like the class size are very small. So when I went to the interview, this one I never shared this before. <laughs> oh, so you are exclusive. Yeah, yeah exclusive. <laughs> so so you know the interview asked me, uh, so you want to study law? So what do you want to be become, you know? At that I haven't signed any bond yeah. or anything, any 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 employment thing. So I said, Oh, uh, if I study law, I want to become a police officer. Wow. Yeah, I can see the two interviewers at me kind of like not not impressed, but shocked. Yeah. Because everybody that was interviewed yeah. before me wants to be like a, you know, uh, I yeah. want to be a litigation lawyer, I want to be a corporate lawyer, I want to be a family lawyer, a criminal lawyer. So yeah. they come to me and I say, I want to be a policeman. <laughs> oh, they're, they're kind of like oh, taken What's aback. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, uh, well, they, they, I, I don't know, probably they, they, they kind of like, they were convinced. Yeah, because uh, I, I made it to law school. So, oh. and uh, that, that's. And, and I made it in, then uh, th thereafter I, I took on the scholarship. Like, because uh, then, uh, as I shared, um, you know, uh, because of my dad's illness, he had to retire very early. And uh, and so, well, the scholarship helped. Like. Otherwise, I would have started working first before even going to uni. So I think that, that helped. Uh, and uh, I served six years. I might be born. And, uh, and then after that, NTUC. Oh, wow. Okay. So... Uh, now that you're an MP, can you just share briefly what's uh, a day in the life of an MP? It's hectic. Yeah, you're asking pre-COVID or now? Uh, both lah, both. Both uh, so people know. I think I think the, the 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 difference is now more activities are virtual, like tonight session. Yeah. So, but uh, but actually the normal days early. I I I actually I don't sleep quite a lot. Uh, sadly, you no. Know? Yeah, I I I just got myself a health kind of like. Uh, <laughs> Morning, till I realize uh, I get very low scores on enough sleep or not. On no. average, how many hours? Five. <gasps> really average. Yeah, really, yeah. Some days four, some days three and a half. It's because you are too busy. No, I think, I think, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm a kind of night hour. I sleep quite late. 
But the problem because my, my kids all go to school. Yeah, so you have so to wake and up. And the whole family wakes up at six. Yeah. So whatever I time I sleep, I wake up at six. So you can do your math mm. backwards. Eh? Mm. So, so that's why I only clock like five hours. The only time I, I get to sleep longer is when I go on holidays with them. <laughs> but now no overseas holidays. So oh, I'm sleep uh, deprived now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and 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 uh, so so not enough sleep lah. So we, I wake up early. So my usual routine is morning. You know, I, I get my kids to school. I mean, the only time I have like a bit of interaction with them, mm. and then and then it's off to work. Yeah. Yeah. Breakfast first. Usually I have my mee pot or one tummy. Mm. Yeah. Then I, I head off work. Uh. And and uh, rest of the day, most of the daytime a lot of meetings and uh, uh well different things that I do in the labor movement. I wear a few hats from financial sector to. You know, strategy to legal and you know, all the legal issues that come up. And you know, in this COVID nineteen, you see a lot of mm. tripartite advisories and all this, and all the, the different skirmishes you have with employers and, and workers. So I, I get in, I get quite busy with that, and of course the com, com, constituency work. Yeah, besides meet the people sessions yeah, on Monday nights, I do house regular house visits. Mm. Yeah, um, and of course, uh, I, I we also you know look after the town council. So, so all these, uh, and then all the grassroots meeting. In fact, I, as I'm talking now, actually there's a grassroots meeting going on. They are waiting for me, but oh, no. looks like uh, they will have ended by the time we finish this evening oh, no. session. But never mind. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so, so things like that uh, keeps me uh, quite engaged. So actually on a normal day, I'm like, uh, depending on which day of the week, I might be back home quite late. Mm. Uh, so when my kids were younger and they, they, they step longer hours, now they sleep a bit later. Mm. Uh, I, I I see them growing up in bed la, longer and longer. But um, but now, of course, work from home. Uh, the only blessing is uh, they see more of me physically, whether they see more of me, uh, you know, yeah. other <laughs> other aspects, I don't know. But at least they see me physically more at home yeah. uh, in the last uh, 15 months. And uh, and, and so, so that's, in a way, uh, you know, summarizes my work day. La. Okay. And, uh, and, and where possible, I try to sleep in some exercise. Um, I, I I try to brisk walk and I try to swim. So I swim in public pools. Uh, I don't uh, yeah, I I give a hint which pools I go to. It's either Katong, uh, Bedok, or Tampanese. Oh, right, yeah. helpful. Okay, but okay, I but guess, all in the east. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <That's why. laughs> okay, another question that Anonymous had for you, right? Is as an MP, what are some of the best comments and some of the worst comments that you've received from residents? I, I I think I think the best comments were not comments, but they they come and see me you know, I meet a business session and then bring oh. some cakes for my for, oh, uh, the gestures uh. yeah so nice you know it's oh. like I, I think the, the, the one that wowed me uh, I it's like blow my mind was one fine day uh, this gentleman was in Boon Lay constituency he, he brought uh, he actually took my picture from my poster or somewhere on the net he actually sketched it you know? oh yeah I, I, I ever posted on Facebook like, I don't know I, I, I don't know when too many postings so I can't remember when but I, but I still have that he, and he, he he drew a life-size kind of like uh, sketch of me. Wow, it, it looks real, real. It's, I, for more, like, wow. Uh, it, totally odd. You know? and, then, and then to you. Yeah, and then he framed it and he signed it and then he said, uh, no, then he said, thank you for serving us. And oh. But kind of like he helped him in some successful appeal Yeah. Uh, for, for something which uh, not convenient to share. But but uh, he was very appreciative and he spent like, I don't know how many hours, man. Yeah. It's like really beautiful piece. I still have it in my office next to it on the wall. Yeah. Wow. So, so that was the, the positive one. Yeah, how did you uh, do uh, the negative ones? Uh, negative ones, uh, I, I think I, I, not just myself, like, many of the members of parliament get it. When we do house visits, uh, they, they, the, 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 the often times they say, well, I only see you once uh, when there's general election or once in five years, you know. Oh. Yeah, but, but a bit ouch. Oh. Because, because actually, uh, most of us do regular house visits, yeah. But in every of our house visits, not everybody is at home, mm. yeah. Particularly prior to COVID, I mean now a bit better, and yeah, more people at home. But they have, I mean, for example, I go like an evening house visit at eight o'clock. Some may be still at their in law space having dinner or picking up their children and going out for dinner mm. on the way back. Uh, so so we may miss the so so the hit rate like you know the people at home probably hovers around 30, 40 percent. Mm. So so there'll be still the sixty percent who have not seen you. So although you have physically gone there, but yeah. uh, they thought you didn't come, and then, and then it's so timing. You know, it's like this person every time you go that block, and they don't see you because he's either away or not at home or variety. So then finally they see you. They say, "Hey, how come only election oh. day you kind of?" Visit? So it's kind of like a bit ouch, lah. Like, I've been oh. working so hard. Coming, this is the third time I'm here, you know, But 
but but, but why you say I, I yeah. well, it's like you know not doing your work you know so sometimes it's a uh, not just me I think I, a lot of my co- parliamentary colleagues share this so um you know sometimes it's, so we we I mean we do our best uh, we touch our heart yeah. uh, of course um, these days you have social media uh so we we post some of these visits to the <laughs> social media so it helps kind of like a journal yeah yeah so uh so uh, then we we try our best okay. If you have to pick one, uh, it can be the funniest or like the most memorable uh, encounter with a resident, what would it be? Funniest. Oh, memorable is also okay. Memorable. Yeah. I think the memorable... I think the, the memorable ones are actually not just one on many occasions where sometimes they, uh, the, the requests they make, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I do house visits, as well as during meet the people sessions, so sometimes some of the requests they make uh, quite interesting. Uh, for example, um, uh, this uh, occurs. In fact, in fact, just a couple of days back, last over the weekend, when I did a house visit, also it, it occurred. Um, this resident will say, you know, uh, uh, I, I, you know, downstairs there's a chair, a, a bench. Can you remove it? Uh? <laughs> yeah, because every time got people there making noise and sitting there and uh, loitering. Yeah, and uh, I feel unsafe. Yeah, and, and especially like, you know, uh, you know, we have young, young uh, the children who are young ladies or whatever. It's quite, I feel unsafe. Like, why can you remove it? Sometimes I see some unknown people, strangers sitting there, and then they're drinking and something. So there's a, a, a yeah. chair. That, that's one house. So then I, I walk the, the next level or a uh. few levels down, or even meet another, an elderly resident. Yeah. Say, uh, it, it, the converse happens. Oh. Yeah. They want uh, a chair. Yeah. Can you put a chair, Mister Tay? Can you put a chair or bench down there? Because sometimes I'm waiking for my grandchildren, oh, school bus. Okay. So, and or I come back from the market. I'm carrying heavy. I want to rest for a while yeah. before I go. So so it's like a competing demands. So so therein lies uh so so it, it, it uh so this is the dilemma sometimes we face uh. So they're competing demands and needs. So we we try to weigh and come up with some the best ideas uh. yeah. So uh sometimes we manage to find solutions. Sometimes maybe not. Uh, a possible solution, for example, is get a chair that, you know, just nice for the, the, our seniors to be able to sit, but at the same time, not so comfortable that you can lounge there and make noise and, you know, consume alcohol or whatever. So I think, I think that's the, 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 the challenge and the, the, the funny thing. So you go, you go to the same block, but you have competing requests. Huh? One to take off, one to put in, one to take off, one to put in. So that's an example of a bit more uh, interesting. Okay. I have, okay, this is the second last question of tonight, okay? And I'll show the question uh, that my uh, co-founder asked you again. Uh, as, uh, next question, um, what are some good reasons not, not become to become an MP? I, I think, I think uh, being a member of parliament requires a lot of commitment. Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a service to the people and, and uh, you're accountable to the people and your, uh, your voters in your, your constituency as well. So I think... Uh, but but at the same time also you you um, you know very very important people at home you know, your family uh, particularly for those who are married you know your wife or you have children your children I think I think uh, uh, I think you, these are topics that they need to be discussed yeah yeah before you go into it. it's it's a big commitment uh, in terms of time in uh, in energies uh, because you have to you have to do more of uh, one you need to sacrifice others. So uh, uh, not just the, the member of parliament, but also the, the people around him, his colleagues, his friends, mm. yeah, his family, his relatives, everybody will, everybody wants your, your time, you know. Mm-hmm. So so you only have that much time per day. So if, when you dedicate more to this, uh, the others will, uh, will will be affected. So very, very important. Uh, if, if your family members or, or people around you uh, need you more, so, so you have to think carefully. La. So all of us always... Uh, one big question we need to always ask ourselves before we, we, we you know, we, we accept this you know, responsibility and, and to stand up as a candidate is, to, of, of course, to see whether the family supports. Right. So if you don't have strong family support, uh, my advice is uh, don't be a member of parliament. You know, there's a lot of commitment, uh, time, yeah, energies uh, that will be, uh, that will take up of you. Okay, yeah. so if, uh, if you're interested in being an MP, right, then these are some considerations that you need to think about as well. Right before you really commit into it wholeheartedly. Yeah. Okay, one last question that is for fun. Uh by Marcus Chai. Uh Wang Shang Wang or D24. <laughs> durian is Okay, okay. Durian Recently durian. I've been uh, eating some durian. <laughs> so it's MSW. Oh really? 
Okay, now we have it. We have the answer. Anyway, this is a good uh, bridging uh, question to our next VTV episode that's happening actually next week. Uh, we'll be actually talk, uh, talking about durians wow. and uh, taste testing durians. So lucky me, for the first time I get to eat during uh, the show. But so if you're interested, right, remember the tuning because it's going to be all about durians uh, in the next I episode. I should get <laughs> You can, you can. Uh, oh, if you have time. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. So, you know, we've shared a lot about uh, you know what, um, uh, Mr. Patrick Tay's uh, food recommendations, and then know you know do actually uh follow our socials. So I'll just pull out the next slide for you to see. So these are actually the socials that you can follow uh, uh to actually be in the know of our latest announcements. And for example, you know if we have like new rewards, and in this case, for example, like the document that we'll be sharing uh, on what are his uh, food recommendations are, then you'll get notified via our socials because that's where uh, we'll actually be announcing it firsthand and when we actually publish it on our website. Also, because uh, you know, after this show, we also will be sharing some of the reports. You know that uh, Mr. Tay is a very, very. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you have to share some of these reports that we'll yeah. be sharing. I, as I well. think there are a few very, very uh, useful, uh, you know, uh, handles or should I say links. Yeah. Um, the various websites have, particularly the Ministry of Manpower website. Uh, uh, there are three I thought uh, to let everyone know. I mean, the last Friday, the Employment Standards Report for 2020 just came out, so it's a good sense of you know what's the employment standards in Singapore. Actually, two other important sites. Uh, one, uh, uh, which we will share the, the link, uh, will be the COVID-19 advisories. Yeah. Um, there's a whole list of rules, regulation, advisories that come up like, literally on the fly, uh, literally. Uh, so that, 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 that page or that link will link you to all the necessary information you know to navigate COVID-19. Whether you're an HR person, you're running a business, you're a freelancer, you're a worker, it's all there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, anything that's to do with COVID, all the advisories. And the other one is, of course, the labor market reports. Um, MOM takes a very, very, uh, you know, proactive role to, um, to or proactively uh, shares quarterly reports on how the labor market is, like where are the new jobs, uh, how is the employment market, you know, where, how bad is unemployment, are there people being retrenched? All this information are encapsulated in the labor market, the quarterly labor market reports as well as the annual one. So uh, that's another third link which I thought uh, useful if you want to get a sense of what's happening in the labor market. Yeah, so we will actually consolidate all, all these reports into like a, a, a place that we can claim it very easily because you know sometimes you may be interested in reading these reports but you don't know exactly where to find them but we'll be doing that uh, in, a, in a more uh, systematic way on our website so they can find it very easily and download and read them if you're interested. Okay, so again, if you'd like to know when we will actually be dropping this, again, follow us on our socials and once it goes out right, then you'll be notified instantly. All right, so uh, for those of you who actually asked your questions also on our YouTube live chat, if we didn't manage to answer all your questions, don't worry because I'll be transferring the questions over from our YouTube live chat to our Sydney's Q&A platform. So what we'll do is once once all the questions there are being uh, ported over and then once, uh, you know, um, Mr. Tay has actually answered those questions, then we'll let you know as well so that you can go back and check in on those answers. But if not, thank you so much again. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, to the <laughs> thanks to the Sydney team for having me. Oh no, but thank yeah. you so much, you know, Mr. Patrick Tay, Member of Parliament for Pioneer SMC, for actually joining us today on this show. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank for you. Good in. night, everyone. Bye. Yeah.